And so staying with the, the kind of format or the kind of place that we've been in this year of maturity. Wherever I go at the moment, speaking about maturity, speaking about Christians being mature. And I want to continue to stay in that place and say, come on, we've got to reach a maturity. We've got to increase. We've got to step it up. It doesn't matter if you've been in church for 30 years, 50 years, 70 years. It doesn't matter. There's a message for us all. Maturity. We're never too mature. Never too mature. There's always something more we can grab onto. There's always deeper we can go with God. And so I took this very simple passage about the barren tree. And so a lot of you will know the story uh, or the parable. And you'll know it. It's a very, very simple one. I'll explain the context and then put it into how this can work for us. And so he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilise it. And then final verse, and if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Man turns up to the vineyard, looks at this tree. He says, this has been growing for three years and it still produced no fruit. I'm going to cut it down. Why is it taking up all the resources? It's wasting time. This tree needs to bear fruit. It's not bearing fruit. And so I'm going to cut it down. Man jumps in the way, says, whoa, whoa, please don't cut it down. Just, I'm obviously paraphrasing this, putting it in my story um, for those that struggle with the set as the Bible. But it's the same thing. And so you're there and you're saying, uh, please don't, don't, don't cut it down, sir. What I do, I'll look after it for a year. And then if it doesn't produce fruit, then you can cut it down. Very, very simple. Um, in the same way, when we put that to our own lives, there's a lot of messages or a lot of um, lessons we're going to get out of this in a moment. But you've got the tree, it needs to bear fruit. After three years, it's borne no fruit. And so God says, enough's enough, I'm going to cut it down. And so you can see where we're going with this. In our own lives, we need to bear fruit. There comes a time when enough's enough. And so the context, just so you've got it in its right context, Jesus is warning a nation of Israel to repent and bear fruit in keeping with repentance. But what we're seeing is that God is patient and he's merciful because he's patient because it's gone three years and bearing no fruit. I, you know, I've been with you now three years and you're still bearing no fruit. I'm patient with you. I'm going to cut you down. And then all of a sudden, it's like, OK, I'm going to give you another year. And we see the mercy coming through. And in our own lives, we're going to see this. In our own lives. But the lessons that we can take from it, because the moral of the story for me, if, if we want to take a moral of the story out, is true repentance produces fruit. True repentance is going to produce fruit. This fig tree, if it's true to what it's supposed to be, it's going to produce figs. It's going to produce its fruit. True repentance will produce fruit. As a church, if we don't produce fruit, and if you like, but we squander the valuable resources, remember when it says, why is he taking up the resources? Why is he, why is he in the ground taking up everything out of the ground, the goodness, that the, the nutrients come up? It's just a waste. As a church, if we're taking up the resources, if you like, and we're not using them, or we're not doing well with them when they could have been given to others, if we just read this section just once more, if we go back to the beginning of it and we'll go from it for us, I think. So back to verse, there we are. He also spoke this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. It kind of shows me that, you know, God is going to come to us and he's seeking and he's saying, look, is there any fruit in your life? Is there any fruit in your life? Is the 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 fruit in my life? He, he comes looking, expecting to find fruit. He wants to see fruit. The very thing God does for our lives. He wants to see fruit coming up. In verse 7, it says, Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I've found none. Cut it down, why does it use up the ground? For three years. 
For three years I've come. How long has God been coming to your life, looking at your life and saying, is it bearing any fruit? Is it bearing fruit in keeping with repentance? Is it doing the very thing that you claimed? When you gave your life to Jesus, that was it. You were saying, I reject my old life. I'm now turning to you, God. And now that I turn to you, my life is going to look different. The things in my life are going to be different. You're going to see fruit coming. Now, as any fruit tree, it takes several years for a fruit tree to start bearing fruit. You all knew that because we're all great with agriculture and our gardens and whatnot. We all knew that. But it takes several years for a fruit tree to start bearing fruit. In the same way, there's that period of grace, if you like, for us as Christians where... I'm not saying that God says on day one, oh, don't worry, you can mess up every day for the next two years as a grace period. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is when we do slip over and we do fall in the very basic things, I think there's that period of grace where God says, come on, get back up, let's go again, keep going, come on. Come on, and there's that little bit more of that arm around your shoulder and come on, get back up, come on, keep going. I know this is new for you, but you've got to make the right choices. We've got a new puppy in our house at the moment. So my daughter had a puppy for her 18th birthday. And um, I'm obviously the one training it. And so I've been training it. And within a week, we've got it toilet trained and everything. It knows how to go outside, sit at the back door and tell me I want to use the toilet. And out it goes. But at the beginning, in that first week, there were a few mistakes. Now, in those mistakes, I didn't do what we were taught when we were younger, you know, when we were growing up and they, your nan or your auntie or someone said to you, you know, when you got a dog, if they make a mistake, grab its face, rub its nose on it and then send it outside. I, did anyone else's nans and grandad? Yeah, that, that's all right then. I was thinking I was just with my, my family psychos. But that's what I was taught. This is what you do, Erin. They make a mistake, grab their nose, rub it in it, send them outside. Um, my nan said she used to do that to the kids when they made a mistake as well. That's not a joke. Um, that is the truth. You wondered why I went off the rails a bit. My face was rubbed in stuff it shouldn't have been. But anyway, the dog, he made a mistake. I didn't grab his nose, rub it in it and say outside. I was like, oh, come on, pick it up. I was a little bit harsher than that, by the way, but I don't think I should... I should just lie at this moment. I pee, oh, come on, little boy, it's okay. No, and so I took it to the back door, opened it, and I said, no, outside. Pushed him outside, out he goes. He did what he needed to do. He finished it off. What did I do? I got a treat out, and I said, who's a good boy? And I started, like, rubbing his face and, like, tapping him. Well done, boy, and giving him a treat, and then he is again outside, and I give him another treat, and I'm training him in the way to go. I'm training him. A week later... We don't have mistakes. He sits at the back door. If I don't know he's there, I hear a little whine or whatever he does. And then I'm like, he's at the back door. Open the back door, out he goes. Does his stuff, comes in, sits down, waiting for the treat. Eventually, the treats are going to stop. There's this period of grace where it's like God answers these most simplest of prayers, silly prayers at times. And it's like, as you get older... It's like, why don't those prayers get answered anymore? And I think at the beginning, it's not that God, you had more childlike faith at the beginning. We always say that. Oh, it was childlike faith we had right at the beginning. I actually think it's more to do with, does this like God grow in your faith? He answers the most simplest of prayers at the beginning. And it's kind of like a faith builder for you. But then as you mature and you get older, it's not like you don't get that car parking space that you prayed for on the way to the shopping centre. Although you still all pray for your car parking space. You know, there's people around the world that are dying and you need a park, car parking space. And our God's going to provide that car parking space for you because you deserve the car parking space. While there's people around the world dying in famines and floods and everything else. But we deserve our car parking space. And yet at the beginning of our walk, we'd pray for a car parking space in Asda. And we get it. Like, yeah. That's my God. And then we take that in and I know some of you still pray for it. I'm not knocking. And if you get it, fair play to you. Pray that I get one as well because I never get them. But the thing that I, I see in that is God answers these really little prayers early on. And yet as we get older, there's a different expectation from him. When my dog or my daughter's dog, I'm the master. When my daughter's dog is no longer a puppy and it's an adult dog, 
and it's still living with me because my daughter still hasn't moved out and taken it. Um, if he makes a mistake in the house, there'd be a greater expectation for him not to, if you, if you get what I mean. There won't be a, oh, you boy, outside, have a treat now that you've done it out. No, there'd be a bit more shouting, a bit more firm of that door open. Get outside! I, out it would go. But as it was growing in, in its puppy stages, sometimes I'm, I'm doing stuff where I see how the grace of God has been in my life in those early stages. But as I've matured in my faith, there's an expectation. God turns up and he says, all right, Aaron, three years you've been making that same mistake now. Enough's enough. It's time to start bearing some fruit. Enough's enough. You're not going to keep making that mistake, Aaron. Enough's enough. And then in a really like in-your-face kind of way, um, here we've got this fruit tree. It's bearing no figs. And God said, I'm not sure that this is true repentance. I'm not sure that this is a tree that's, no, I'm going to cut you down instead. I'm going to cut you down and throw you into the fire. He's speaking to the nation of Israel, we know, but as we put it to us, as we talk to us and bring it into our individual lives or in the lives of our church, as LBC Langley was saying, we need to make sure that we're producing fruit. Not out of fear. It's not out of fear. It's because God has changed our lives and God has done something in us and we, we've met our master and we know that he's our master. Like, you know, dogs are the most loyal, the loyalest things going. They're so loyal. I keep saying to my wife, yeah, having this German shepherd, German shepherd as well, German shepherd's best dogs, but they're so loyal. And I was just like, after the year I've had of people, I want a dog because they're so loyal. Doesn't leave my side, just in, in between my legs, sometimes gets in the way, like, just move, will ya? Um, but anyway, he's, he's just there, he's so loyal, so loyal. If you, if you go out the room, he's like crying for you, like he wants you, he's so loyal. People aren't always that loyal. But God's very loyal. God's so loyal. God's so loyal to us that I, I want to produce fruit for him. In the same way, the puppy wants to get things right for his master. He's, he's, he's learning to, I want to do what's right for master. Not just because he gets a treat, although that does help a lot. But he, he wants to do right. He wants to please his master. In the same way, I want to please my master. I want to bear fruit for him. Not because I'm like shaking with fear if I don't. And yet, if there is no fear of the Lord in your life, we do have an issue. Because the fear of the Lord is needed. You have to understand how great and big our God is. There must be a fear of the Lord in the case of an awe. I, I just thought, wow, God created the heavens and the earth. So you come from that angle, that fear of the Lord. At the same time, we do need to step into the whole judgmental stage of it. Like There is a time when God will judge the world. Revelation tells us that Jesus, one day we will all stand before Jesus and Jesus will judge us. At the end of this verse, in verse 9, it says that it shows you that judgment is real because it talks about throwing them into the fire. We put, yeah, and if it bears fruit, well, but if not, cut it down and throw it away. Cut it down. It's, it's talking about a judgment. In other passages in the Bible, it speaks the axe is at the root of the tree. If it bears no, cut it down and throw it into the fire. Judgment is real, judgment will, will come, but for the believer, um, whether you put it like this to the non-believer, it's like judgment for punishment. And for the believer, it's like uh, for rewards, depending on how you want to look at it. But the truth is we all stand before God. We all give an account of our lives. Judgment is real. A fair God will come to judge. Otherwise, it could just be a freebie, just a party on the world. Everyone do what they want. But God is looking for his people to bear fruit in truth with the repentance that they've said. And so if he comes to you now, is there something in your life that you're still going three years on and you're still not dealing with? Is there something in your life that it's just like going around a mountain and you're still not breaking it? There must come a time where we say, okay, enough's enough. Because that must happen in God where he says, enough's enough. I, I need this fruit in line with your repentance. Otherwise, they were just words. Similarly, Mark chapter 3, verse 10, it says, and even now, uh, and even now, the, sorry, I couldn't see, the axe is laid to the roots of, my, of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Mark 11, where he curses the fig tree. Remember when Jesus walking down curses the fig tree? 
Um, I always wondered, I, I'm looking into it a little bit more, but I always wondered, why did he curse the fig tree? Um, because the very next verse says, and if I had time to go into it, I'd get it up and show you, but the very next bit says that he cursed the fig tree because it bore no fruit, but it wasn't the season for figs. So it wasn't the season, so it's not really the fig tree's fault, is it? And yet he cursed it. And then as you look a little bit deeper, because we all looked a little bit deeper, and we all know that before the figs come out, there's a pre-fruit that comes out on those. And that hadn't borne anything. But the leaves were there. And so you've got the leaves on the tree, and when the leaves are there, the pre-fruit should have been there, which meant there should have been some kind of fruit for him to eat. But there was nothing there. And so it gives us a picture, if you like, this picture of you've got this tree that's looking like it's there for purpose, fit for purpose, doing something. God turns up, Jesus turns up to it, and it's got no fruit on. It's saying all the right things from the outside. It looks right, but it's produced nothing. And he goes, that's it, you're cursed. Never will you bear fruit again. I'm going to cut you down, throw you into the fire if you like. Enough's enough. You were wearing all the right clothes. You were wearing your nice green leaves. You were saying all the right things. You were standing out in the forest looking like you were a real Christian. Looking like you were a real fig tree. And yet I turned up to you and you got no fruit on you. So that's it. I've cursed you. You will not bear no fruit again. In the same way the church, I think Jesus was talking to his disciples and there's a deeper picture in this. When the disciples are, why did he curse the tree? Like the, the tree that he said he was going to curse, he's cursed. And now it's withered away and it brings no fruit. It's incredible. I think there is that moment of like, ah, God's incredible. Anything that we say in faith, I think we, we go into that kind of moment with him. But I think there's another picture where God is saying, or Jesus is saying to them, look, that fig tree was meant to bear fruit. It looked like a fig tree. Even leaves came on it. It was time for fruit, and yet it bore no fruit. And so I, I cursed it. It wouldn't surprise me if he sat down and went a little bit deeper with them on that. In the same way, again, as we come back to this, there's a fig tree. It's bearing no fruit for three years. And so down comes the guy. He says, I'm going to cut this down. One man steps in, give us one more year. One more year, I'll cut round it, I'll fertilise it. I'll put all our other resources into it. Just give it time. And the guy's like, all right, we'll give it one more year. But if I return, it's still not. I'm going to cut it down. It's a sign of God's mercy to us. It's a sign of God's patience with us. God is very patient with us. He gives us some more chances. There's many a time when I've probably deserved to be cut down, if you like. Cut me down, throw me into the fire. I probably deserve that. Obviously, that sounds quite horrific right now as I'm saying it. But I deserve to be like, you've had enough chances, Aaron. But that's the God that we serve. We serve a God of, of an, another chance. The word of the Lord came a second time to Jonah. Jonah messed up big time. Ran in a different direction. He messed up big time. And yet the Bible says the word of the Lord came a second time to Jonah. Many times in our lives, the word of the Lord has come a second time to us. If it stopped at a second time, we'd all be in trouble because some of us have needed the third time and the fourth time and the fifth time and the tenth time and the twentieth time. We serve a very merciful God. We serve a God that knows we live in a fallen world. We serve a God that knows that we get things wrong. But we do serve a God that turns up to our tree, our fig tree if you like, and says, I've come to see the fruit. And if there is no fruit, I won't continue like this forever and ever and ever. We need to get this right. We need to show fruit in the truth of our repentance. If we've truly repented, there must be fruit that's coming after it. We cannot just be words. The Pharisees, they said all the right things. But what was it? They honour moved their lips, but I'm far from their hearts. They deny me. What, what's the difference with us when we say we give our lives to Jesus, we live for Jesus now, we honour him with our lips in the, in the service and we raise our hands and we say hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then when church is over, we go outside, back into the world, do the very things that we're meant to have repented from. What's the difference? Our lips have honoured him on a Sunday, but our hearts are truly from him. What did Jesus say about the, the Pharisees? You better get more righteous than them. That's obviously paraphrased. But you, you better be a lot more righteous than them. 
If that's your level, if you think that's your level of what it is, you have no idea. You need to raise that bar. They might do the right things, say the right things, but it's more about their heart than it was anything else. And this is what gives us all a lot of hope because we do fall down and we do get it wrong and we do make mistakes. And some of us have been making so many mistakes over the so many years that we've known Jesus. But the fact that you're still here today, the fact that you're still going, the fact that you still break your heart when you get it wrong, the fact that in those quiet times you say, Lord, I'm so sorry, I wish I hadn't done that. That for me shows a whole lot of fruit. It shows a whole lot of fruit. A broken heart that keeps coming to Jesus saying, I've messed up. It's the righteous man falls down seven times, but seven times he gets back up. So if you're somebody that keeps falling all the time, don't let this be a message that makes you go away saying, oh no, if I don't get it right in this next year, he's going to come and cut me down, throw me into the fire. Don't, don't let that be the message. And yet at the same time, let out of that message, there be something that kind of pushes you and says, Enough's enough. We're not going to stay in this place. I don't want to stay in this place. One, for my own benefit, I don't want to stay in this place. But two, I want to get it right for my master. Amen. The German shepherd wants to get it right for me. He wants to get it right for me. But he also wants to get it right for him. Why? Because he wants that treat. Why? Because he doesn't want to get shouted at. Why? Because he doesn't want his face rubbed in his mess. Not that I would do that, but if I did do that, he wouldn't want that. But he doesn't want that. How many times do we slip on our own sick? And some of you have taken that naturally and you're like, yeah, I've done that as well. It was a Friday night. I had far too many. I, I, yeah, what I was talking about was a proverb. It's a proverb where it says that a dog returns to his vomit. If you return to your vomit... What does a dog do when he returns to his vomit? He eats it. Okay. What does a, a man or a woman do when they return to their vomit? It's probably because they've had far too many to drink and there's a possibility that they're about to slip on it. Okay. There's where the slip on the sick. Anyway, do not return to your vomit. God set you free from it. Stop going back to it. Stop going back to it. Mature. Grow up in the faith. God's got so much more planned for you, so much more planned for you. If only you would grab hold of it. If only you would walk in and say, I want it all. I don't just want a little bit. That little puppy, he, he gets everything. He's got the hugs and the, the cuddles and everything else. And the come here, boy, he gets it all. He doesn't just have a little, okay, you've done a wee out, so there's a treat. I'm not talking to you now. He gets it all. God wants to give you all. He wants to give it everything. He wants to give you everything. He wants to cuddle you, kiss you, hug you, rub your bellies, tap your back, do whatever. Do it all. The whole Shabbat. He wants to do it all. He wants to walk with you. He wants to see you grow into the very thing that he's called of you. Into the very thing. But so many times we never move on because we are immature. We just, we settle. We, we've we got enough. I got my ticket. There is no golden ticket to heaven. It's not a case of I gave my life to Jesus, got a golden ticket, I'm in. That's the end of it. It's I've repented, I've given my life to Jesus. There's been a genuine change in me. The Holy Spirit made his life in me and now God's cutting things off for me. It, it might take 40 years, it might take 10 years, it might take three years, it might take three weeks. I'm not here to say there's a time limit. I think as individuals, we're all different. But when we go down, we've got to get back up and you've got to get up quick. If you've had a problem in church, and so many times I see this, people have an issue in church and they're like, they've been offended in church or something's happened in church and they walk away from church. And then they're a year outside the church. I was outside of church for two years, offended. Outside of church, I'm not going back to church. I don't like Christians. I love God, but I don't like Christians. What happened to my life? What happened to my walk? It started walking back to the vomit. That's what happened. It started going back in the wrong direction. It started doing things that it would never have done when I was plugged into a local church, when I was with other believers. Because if you've got a barbecue and you've got all those hot coals, all those red hot coals, they're all red when they're together. They're all embers on fire, hot, burning hot. 
If I get one red hot coal, put it on the side on its own like I was, I left the church, went on my own on the side. I'm still a, a coal that's come out of the barbecue. I'm still the same as you. I've come from the same place, but I'm now on my own. What happens to that red hot ember? It starts to cool down and it goes black as charcoal again. I lost my fire. So you pick me up, you place me back in the church with the other red hot embers. I started to burn again. That's why we need the church. That's why we can't do it on our own. We're a barbecue church. That's what we are. We're a barbecue. You know, get in the middle of this barbecue. Set yourself for light. Elijah's a barbecue. He's part of the barbecue. He's going to say to his mom after what Uncle Aaron said, I'm a barbecue for. I don't get it. We're a barbecue. We need to be set on fire. When you take yourself out, put yourself on the outside and you do it alone, you will go down cool. And then I, I promise you, you're isolated. It's easier for the enemy to pick you off. It's easier for the enemy to pick you off. It's not as easy when you're in the church. It's not as easy when you're with your other coals right next to you. It's not as easy when your brothers and sisters are standing with you. It's not as easy then. It's not as easy then. Enemy doesn't have as easy a shot. We've got to mature a church. We have to mature. Our repentance wasn't just me saying sorry. My repentance was me saying I turned from my old life. I'm looking to you, Jesus, and now I'm going. I'm 17, 18 years into my faith, something like that. It's not enough to say, well, when I became a Christian, I, I turned my back on drugs, I turned my back on those things and that thing. Um, I've done my repentance and now I can do what I, I want. Uh, I'm a lot better than I was. No, it's, it's continually choosing the things that are right. It's continually walking in righteousness. It's continually saying, I'm going after Jesus. Continually. Continually doing the right thing. If you continually do the bad thing, the wrong thing, you won't look like Jesus. What happened? When we give our lives to Jesus, we're told to look like him. We're told to, I no longer want to be like me. It's Christ that lives through me. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me and through me. That's, that's how I know when I come across other believers. Not because they told me, oh, I'm a Christian. Just give me a couple of weeks with them and I'll tell you if they're a Christian. Give me a couple of weeks. Anyone can stand at the front of this church. I can stand at the front of this church, say a whole lot of certain things to you, and you all go, wow, he's a mighty man of God, mighty man of God. But if you want to know if I'm a mighty man of God, or you want to know I am the things that I preach or say or whatever, the best person to talk to would be my wife who sees me all the time. In the same way, God sees us all the time. God knows me better than my wife knows me because he sees me when she doesn't see me. She might see me for like 90% of the time, but that other 10%, God sees even that. When God looks at us, is he looking at a man that truly repented and is now keeping true with that repentance by the fruit that he's producing? Because if not, what happens when God turns up and says, it's now time for me to take an account of your fruit? It's now time for you to give uh, an account of your life to me? Well, I don't want to stand before him with someone that played at Christianity. I want to stand before him in the right way. When I say with my head held high, I don't mean it in a proud way. But I want to hold my head high, stick my chest out, walk into that, into, through the gates, if you like, walk into heaven and say, God, I gave everything. I've left nothing behind. I gave everything, Lord. I gave my last drop. The mission that you gave me, I went for it. I gave it all. I left nothing behind. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to be able to do. I do not want to walk in with my head down like, I'm really sorry, Lord. I wasted a lot of my life. I wasted a lot of my time. The, my life really didn't honour you or respect you in the way that it should have enough times. I'm really sorry. I want to go in there and, of course, I'm never going to be able to do enough for God. But you get what I'm trying to say with the two differences. I don't want to walk in carrying my head down thinking, I could have done so much more. I think when we stand before God, I've said this I don't know how many times, but in 20 years' time, if you like, in 20 years' time, you're going to be more bothered about the things you didn't do for God than the things you did do for him. And in the same way, when we get to heaven, when we stand before the Father, when we see Jesus, when our life is played out before us, I think we're going to 
turn away in disgust at the things we could have done for God. The opportunities he laid on a plate, but because of our laziness, because of our returning to our vomit, because of our not giving everything, we passed up so many opportunities. We could have had so much more in God. We could have done so much more for him. He could have turned up to the tree and gone, wow, this fig tree is bearing so much fruit. My days, let's just trim it off a little bit so you've got more room for more fruit. We could have done so much more. I think some of us, when we get there, we're going to literally hang our head in disappointment of what we could have done for God, but we didn't because we wasted so much time. If we just look quickly at John 15, because it pretty much says a very similar thing. John 15, verse 2 to 6, it says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, this whole word abide, I I think of it as a perseverance. Like Jesus saying, abide in me and I will abide in you. You Stick with me and I'll stick with you. And it's this perseverance because many times in our life it is difficult. We're going through difficult times and we need to persevere. And sometimes it feels easier to abandon ship and jump overboard. And we think because of the mercies of God, he'll accept us back anyway, so don't worry about it. The grace of God will cover me. Here, pull me out of this hole later on. But right now, I'm having a bit of a meltdown. So I'm going to go into the world. I'm going to live life for myself. I'm looking after number one today. And we have that kind of attitude. And you go and you look after number one. And what happens if God turns up when you've decided to look after number one? And it's time to give an account of your life. When the Bible speaks about when Jesus returns, will he find faith on the earth? And I always say, when you return, Lord, I pray that you find find faith in us. That you find faith in us. And I'm not saying that if you have a period in your life where you wonder from God, then all of a sudden you're a lost soul. I'm not saying that, so please don't take that from me. But what I am saying is when people wonder, when they wonder, there's no guarantee that they're going to wonder back. There's no guarantee he who dwells in the shadow of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Why come from under that? He is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Why come outside of that protection? Even if it was just for a day, why do it? Well, why have such a rebellious streak in you that you say, I'm living life for myself now. This God stuff doesn't work. It was, it's not about working. It's about I give my life to Jesus because he gave everything for me. When you stand before the Father, you'll see that it worked. You'll see that it worked when he says, come in, my good and faithful servant. Well, give him some fruit to say, come in, my good and faithful servant, about. Give him some fruit. We've got to mature church. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. We can bear no fruit if we do not abide in God. We can bear no fruit if our relationship with him doesn't go deeper and further. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and he's withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. Again, there's this talk of, look, if you're producing no fruit, I'm going to cut you down and throw you out. There's this continual talk throughout the Bible like this in the New Testament. Fruit must come for the Christian. It must come. It's not a a message that condemns and it's not a message that's meant to bring fear. I'm okay with a message that brings challenge. Go all day long with that. If all of a sudden there's fear that rises up inside, you've got to understand what's that fear? Where's that fear come from? Why is that fear there? We know that perfect love casts out all fear. So we say when you hear something and fear strikes you, we say that fear hasn't come from God, but that fear would come from the enemy. And yet at the same time, there is something called the fear of the Lord. 
I remember when I, at the beginning of my walk, I was living for Jesus, loving him. But the first couple of years, two, three years, I kept falling back into my old life. I'd go and have a session, like one last session with the lads for a weekend. And every six months or summer, I'd go and have a, a last session for those that like, what's it, last session? Um, loads of drink, loads of alcohol, um, drugs, whatever. I would just with the lads one last time. And because I miss them so much and I'll go back to them when we'd have this like blowout. And then I was given this word from somebody in the church. I didn't know nothing about any of this. And they said, God told me to give you this word. I'm kind of like sorry about having to give it you because it's quite a hard word. But here you go. And it comes from Revelation and it says um, it was Jesus speaking to a church. He was actually speaking to a church in its context. But God can speak out of context to give you a word. Don't worry about that. And he said... You're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. When I was given that word, I instantly thought about the other things that I was doing around my life and fear hit me. It was a godly fear. There was a fear that I've got to get my life right with God. I've got to be serious. If, if I'd known the Bible like I do today, I'd be saying stuff like, I need to start producing fruit with which shows my repentance, not just saying the right things. All of a sudden, a fear hit me. So I'm not, I'm not against you having a godly fear, lightning bolt hit you, if it saves your soul. I'm not against that. I'm, go for it. I'm not against a, a godly fear hitting you if it turns your, your sinful ways into righteous path. I'm not against that. At the same time, I am aware that the Bible speaks about perfect love casts out all fear. I am aware that the enemy, Satan, comes to try and sow fear into your life. There's no way God comes to try and sow fear into your life to paralyze you and keep you in a, a fearful place. That's not the work of God. But if in a moment you hear something and then in that moment, like it's like a fear that hits you. Maybe there's another word for it and it would have been better to use another word. But whatever it is, it just hits you and you're like... <gasps> Hell, spew me out of his mouth. I'm okay with that if it changes something. I'm okay with that if it starts you again, a refresh. Sometimes we need that. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and he's withered. And they gathered them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. Church, if you're a believer in this room, if you're a believer in this room, where we speak about it unless it abides... It's kind of saying like spiritual effectiveness is linked to our continual relationship. Our spiritual effectiveness is linked to our spiritual relationship. In the same way, your effectiveness in a gym, uh, pumping weights and getting a higher weight, is going to be linked to your continual relationship with those weights. If you don't keep picking those weights up, you won't be able to, to go above what you were picking up before. If you used to pick up 100 kilograms... All the time, every, every Tuesday you go in the gym, bench press 100 kilograms and you haven't done it for six months. When you go back into the gym, you do not start on 100 kilograms. You'd be down at 60 kilograms and you've got to work your way back up there in the same kind of way. Think of it like this. Now put it in a spiritual sense. If you spend time with God all the time, all of a sudden your, your fruit is different. All of a sudden your life is different. All of a sudden everything changes. Everything's different because you're having a season where you're just with the vine. You're having a season where you're just, you're just drinking from his well. But then if you have six months where you don't drink from his well, when you go back to drinking from his well, there's this huge difference. There's this gulf. It's like before I was doing this, before I was doing that, and now I feel so far away from God. It's linked with our relationship. Our spiritual effectiveness is linked with our spiritual relationship. Stay in the vine, stay with God, stay close to him, keep reading, keep worshipping, keep praying. Don't leave him. Don't leave him. Just stay close to him. The fruit will come. The fruit will come. If you're worried about, am I producing fruit? Am I not producing fruit? Trust me. Stay with Jesus. Stay close to him. You won't have to think about it. You don't need to go around thinking, how can I produce fruit? What fruit can I produce? 
And you don't need to go around showing everyone that you're producing it because the Pharisees would do that. They'd stand on the street corners and pray really loud prayers with long words so everyone would see them praying. But they did it with a wrong heart. They would give 10% of all they had, but they'd make sure everybody saw that they gave it. Like, whoa, whoa giving 10% because they did it with a wrong heart. It's not about, you won't need to worry, it will just naturally happen. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more of Jesus will just ooze out of you. you would be like garlic. You know, when you eat loads of garlic, it just oozes out of you. So we're, we're a barbecue and Jesus is like garlic, I don't know. Probably going to get criticised for those examples, but you get what I'm trying to say. Spend time with Jesus, he ooze out of you. You won't have to worry about how do I do the fruit? How do I do this? You won't have to think about it. It would just become who you are. Why? Because it's Christ that's living through you and in you. Without him, we can do nothing. The Bible tells me I can do nothing. And yet there'll be times in you where you have to choose at a crossroads. Do I go this way? Do I go that way? If I go this way, it's going to lead to sin. If I go that way, it's going to lead to righteousness. That's a moment when you have to choose. That's a showing of your maturity because I'm now choosing to follow Jesus. I'm choosing to turn my back on that thing that would take me in the wrong direction. If you drink too much and you know going to a certain pub is going to lead from one to another to another to another to another, what do you do? I'm just going to try, I'm going to make sure, I'm going to go there, see how far I've matured, see if I can go there, have one, and then see if I walk away then. No, a mature Christian will say, I'm not risking it. I'm going this way. That's maturity. Someone that says, I'm going to see how far I've come to see if I'm mature. I used to do it all the time. I used to do it all the time in my early years, and I'd end up having a session at the end of it. Because I was seeing if I could mature. There, the enemy was like, yeah, do that mature thing again, Aaron. Do that mature thing again. Just come on, Aaron. Every time I walk into it, every time I walk into it, to the place when I go, no, I'm a Christian. I'm not going there. I don't need to mess around. Stick your head in the lion's mouth enough times, he'll close his mouth on you. Play with fire, touch fire, you'll burn yourself. In the same way, crossroads, you've got to make some decisions. And that sometimes is going to rely on you making some tough decisions. Through God, we can do nothing. But there is a time at the crossroads where you're leaning on God, but you've still got to make that, I'm not putting my foot there, I'm going this way. You've got to do it as well. You see, Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, but we had to roll away the stone. Jesus was the one that brought the miraculous um, water, turned it into wine, but we had to fill the water jars up. There's work for you to do. Do what you can do, and then God will do what you can't do. Father, we love you. We bless your holy name. Father, help the words that have been spoken today to speak to each person as they need to be spoken. Lord, let not the enemy twist and do things with words that are spoken, that they hear them in a wrong way or in a way that it wasn't meant. Let not there be a message of condemnation on, other, on people's lives in this place. Let everyone walk from this place today whether it be challenged, whether it be encouraged, whatever it may be, Lord. But Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you would do a work that no one else could do. And if, even if you took a passage that we tried to look at today and if we, we messed it up and we destroyed it with our attempt of looking at it, Lord, you just come in with the power of your Holy Spirit and speak even through our frailties and our mess. We love you, Jesus, and we know that you are the great I am. If there's anyone in this room that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, I always give an opportunity. Jesus, he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. I look around, I know pretty much everyone and I'm quite sure that you all know Jesus. But just in case you don't, I give this opportunity because Jesus knows where he can send lost people every week. Because he knows that his name will be glorified and his name will be spoken about. Jesus Christ, he paid the penalty and the price for each and every one of us. You see, the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life. Everyone, let's be honest about this, everyone is on their way away from God. There's two roads. There's one that leads to hell. There's one that leads to life. It leads to eternal life with Christ. We're all going in the wrong direction until that moment comes in each one of our lives where we say, 
I no longer want to run after the world. I no longer want to do the things of the world. But I choose to turn my eyes to the creator of this world and say, Jesus, I believe that you died and you rose again. I believe that you paid the penalty and the price that I deserved. I believe, as the Bible says, he himself bore our sin in his body on the tree or on the cross. That we might die to sin, die to our old life, and we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And so we have that moment in time where we all start going in a certain direction. And there comes a time in our life when we need to say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow the Creator. Or you can continue in your own way. You can continue to, to try. To try and, if you like, if, if you believed in heaven, try and get to heaven on your own works, on your own merits. But the reality is, no man comes to the Father except through Jesus. There's no way, no good amount of works will do it. No great fruit will do it. You can have the biggest fruit tree going. You still won't make it unless you've been clothed with Christ. Let me quickly tell you, because I, I just want to tell you this really quickly. And then I will just ask John, if you want to come up, John, otherwise you know what I'm like. And the time's going and some of you want to go back and watch the football. Um, you know Malchus, the, the high priest that had his ear cut off? Okay. So there's this great picture in that. So when Jesus was going to the cross, there was this high priest, um, servants were there, and Judas, and Judas is to give Jesus a kiss to say, this is the man, arrest him. That, that whole story in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then Peter grabs his sword and he chops. And as he chops off, he chops the whole ear of Malchus off and the ear falls on the floor. And Jesus says, whoa, he that lives by the sword dies by the sword. So what did Jesus do? Jesus went, grabbed the ear, picked the ear up, placed it back on his head and healed him. And I asked myself, why did Jesus heal him? Why did he pick the ear up and put it back on? Was it to show everyone, look at my power, I'm God? Myself. In this moment, what happens when Jesus goes to the cross? Jesus is about to go to the cross. He knows he's going to the cross. He knows he's going to die. He knows he'll rise, rise again. But he knows he's going to the right-hand side of the Father. What's going to happen? Peter's going to be left behind. Peter's left behind. What happens to Peter? Peter, you go into court. You chopped off the servants of the high priest. See ya. It's a death penalty, Peter. You're going to be executed now, Peter, for what you've done. What did Jesus do in that moment? Jesus picked up the ear put it on his head, took away all the evidence. Took away all the evidence. So when Peter stands before the courts and they say, show us the evidence, and you've got Malchus there with his ear completely on, there is no evidence. He's took away all the evidence, so there's no death penalty for Peter. In the same way, when Jesus went to the cross, he took away all the evidence. He took all the evidence of my sin. The moment that I said, Jesus, come into my life. Because when the Father looks at me, he no longer sees my sinful state. He no longer sees my ways. The Bible says I've been clothed in righteousness. He took away all the evidence. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, then there's a whole lot of evidence right now of your sinful past. But Jesus wants to take it all away. He wants to take it all away. And so like